So today's seminar, Monitoring Process and Impact Efforts to Improve HPV Vaccination Coverage is organized by the American Cancer Society, National HPV Vaccination Roundtable, Indiana Immunization Coalition, and St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. I'm Gabrielle Darvel Sanders, and I will serve as the moderator for today's session, which is the last seminar of the series focused on improving HPV vaccination coverage. Additional members of our planning committee include St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, Jennifer Conga and Katie Crawford with the American Cancer Society, and Heather Brand and Duba Magzu with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. In the third virtual seminar, we'll focus on strategies for monitoring process and impact efforts to improve HIV vaccination coverage. This session will also attend to processes such as coalition functioning and planning for 2023. Before we begin, I want to address a few housekeeping issues. Today's seminar will be recorded. The link to view the recording and a PDF of today's slides will be shared with all who have registered. In addition, the recording link will be publicly posted in the future. If you have any issues during today's seminar, please use the chat. All participants are muted by the host. We will use the Q&A option for any questions that you may have. You can post these at any time to engage with the presenters and organizers. We will always use, also use a Mentimeter for you to join us in the conversation. And lastly, we will offer CEUs for this event. The link will be included in the chat. The purpose of this series of virtual seminars is to build your skills and enhance the capacity of state teams to improve HB vaccination coverage. We know that many state level teams have been focused on COVID-19 efforts or have been unable to return focus to HB vaccination. The pandemic has disrupted HB vaccination with more than 3.5 million doses missed since March of 2020. Now is the time to recommit to addressing HPV coverage gaps, which remain significant due to the effects of the pandemic. We hope that these seminars serve as a catalyst to support efforts across states. We have identified and developed specific learning objectives for today's seminar. These learning objectives are listed here. So we'll go ahead and start some of our engagement with our first um, Mentimeter question. So engage with the Mentimeter question, you can either go to www.menti.com and use the code provided, or you can go to the link that's been provided in the chat and scan the QR code with your phone camera. We wanna hear from you, so go ahead and join. So what state are you joining us from today? So it looks like we got great representation already from California, Indiana, Arkansas, Pennsylvania, New York. We have a few who are in the chat responding. Nebraska, Arkansas. Great representation from our states. We appreciate you guys joining us today for this session. Vermont, Virginia. Awesome. So second question, what do you hope to learn today from our sessions? We wanna hear from you. What are you engaged in or focused on learning today from our presenters? Collaboration opportunities, ideas, innovative evaluation, how to reach rural populations, how to engage the community. Series completion ideas, better community outreach and latest updates, how to reinvent, reinvent the wheel or revigorating ideas, recommendations and program evaluation. Awesome. Yeah, you know, some of our presenters are gonna talk about some of these same topics that you guys have um, commented on. So we're definitely excited for the content to be provided today. So let's go ahead and transition on to our first presenter. Our first presenter is uh, Dr. Deanna Kepka. Uh, she is a Huntsman Cancer Institute investigator 
and a tenured associate professor in the College of Nursing at the University of Utah. She's a member of the Cancer Control and Population Sciences Research Group. She is the Director of Global and International Health in the College of Nursing and the Founding Director of the 400 plus member 12 state Intermountain West HPV Vaccination Coalition. Kepka's main research interests are the gaps in healthcare access and quality for vulnerable populations as related to cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. She focuses specifically on preventing cervical cancer and other HPV-related cancers among vulnerable patient populations locally and globally. She has more than 60 peer-reviewed publications and recently received the American Cancer Society North Region HPV Vaccination Champion Award in 2018 and the YWCA of Utah Outstanding Achievement Award in Health and Medicine in 2019. Kepka has worked with teams in at-risk communities to promote positive health behaviors in Jamaica, Ghana, Mexico, Peru, Utah, Chicago, North Carolina, and Washington. Let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Kepka. Thank you so much for that very kind in, um, introduction, Gabby. I'm assuming that everyone could hear me okay. And if you can't, let me know, but it sounds like um, Everyone can hear me. Are we going to move to the next slide? Are we going to do a Mentimeter question? So a lot of my work here in the Mountain West um, relates to serving rural communities. So I'd love to hear from how many of you actually have rural communities in your constituency or in the region that you serve. Um, can you hear me? Can other people hear me? Okay, some people can hear me and some people can't hear me. Gabby, are you able to hear me now? Can you please chime in and let me know? Can you come back? Okay, I'm assuming people can hear me. So, okay, great. You can hear me, great. Anyway. Um, so I serve the Mountain West region here at Huntsman Cancer Institute, and we have a vast um, region of rural and frontier communities. So rural, you know, um, are communities that are not metropolitan or not border communities of metropolitan regions, and frontier are the most sparsely populated rural communities. Next slide, please. So it seems like many of you serve rural communities in your region. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about will apply to you. So I'm going to talk about HPV vaccination partnerships in the Mountain West. So the Mount, we, the whole center of our work here at Huntsman Cancer Institute focuses on partnerships and partnership building and communication and working across disciplines. We have the Mountain West, West HPV Vaccination Coalition, which is hosted here at Huntsman. This coalition brings together immunization program representatives with cancer control, pediatric, and primary care specialists, as well as parents and community members who share the common goal of improving HPV vaccination rates in our region. Next, please. We began um, in 2014 with a small supplement from the National Cancer Institute that was offered to cancer um, NCI designated cancer centers. We were among the first cohort of cancer centers to receive that supplement. And one of the goals of the supplement was to build partnerships in our region. And now I know that NCI, I think, has been through three rounds of these supplements. So I'm sure many of you on the call now are connected to NCI designated cancer centers. And thanks to that support that's invigorated us to work together on HPV um, vaccination efforts in the areas we serve. So since that supplement was awarded in 2014, we have nearly tripled our membership working across diverse organizations and institutions in the Mountain West and over the United States. Next slide. This is the territories that are most frequently represented in our coalition activities are the 
darker green and then the lighter lighter green we have participants from those um, regions too participating in our coalition activities. Anyone is welcome to join to partner with us and to learn from each other in our activities. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the area that we serve here at Huntsman Cancer Institute and the data that I'm going to share are coming from Teen Vaxview. And I'm sure most of you have played around with the Teen Vaxview interactive website. It's a fabulous tool to look at HP vaccination rates across the United States by demographic characteristics and within your region. It generates maps and it's really, and you can also download tables for data analysis. Next slide. Next, so we have a little floating circle, I know that. So if you look here, so Huntsman Cancer Institute is right located, if you could see my arrow, in Salt Lake City, which is in the state here, Utah. And we serve these five states. These, this is the area that we serve as designated by the National Cancer Institute. It's a little bit less than 20% of the U.S. territory, which is pretty amazing. We serve five states. We are the only NCI designated cancer center in Nevada, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Utah. So in this region, I like to talk about the sea of light blue. We have a lot of light blue and the same that we have a lot of light blue in the south, but often the west isn't talked about quite as much. And I think it's because we're fairly rural and we do have quite a few favorable health outcomes in the west, but vaccination hesitancy has been a challenge across these states. So if you could see in the legend, we're in the lowest quintile in most of these states, especially Utah and Wyoming for the country for HP vaccination coverage as of 2020. Next slide. And I like to focus on Utah because that's the state that I, um, I would say 30%, 30 to 40% of my work occurs in Utah. Next slide. I mean, next motion. And we were ranked as the 46th state in the country for first dose receipt of the HPV vaccine, just slightly above Wyoming, our neighbor Wyoming. So this is an example of Wyoming, Utah, Nevada. We've got a fair amount of challenges around vaccine hesitancy related to HPV vaccination. And even Idaho, our additional partner, is also um, in the lower, lower quintiles of the United States. Next slide. Next. I know. So then when we look at completion of the series in 2020, we're state number 51, and then Wyoming right behind us at 52. And so we might do a little bit better with that first dose, but we really have problems getting back in to complete the HP vaccination series, according to the NIS team data out here in Utah and in Wyoming. Next slide. However, in 2021, we had some fabulous news. Next and next. We moved up to state number 19. We had a 15 percentage point improvement for first dose of receipt of the HP vaccine in Utah and state number 33 for completion of the series. Next. Next. And we're just seeing this. We went from bottom of the barrel to now top quintile in the United States for first dose and HPV vaccination. Next. We still have a ways to go with um, completion of the series, but we're at least no longer the bottom quintile of the country. Next. Next. And this was fabulous and exciting for Huntsman Cancer Institute. I was on the cover of the Salt Lake Tribune. That's our regional newspaper last week. We had maybe four or five other news stories, and that's my son getting his HPV vaccine. Really exciting that we maybe, hopefully, I really, really hope that we'll see consistent data around this, that we've turned the corner around HP vaccine hesitancy in Utah. It doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of work to do, but we're suddenly turning the corner. And I really feel that this is a reflection of about 10 years worth of hard work among many of our coalition members and other key partners like American Cancer Society, the area health education centers, our community health centers, our health departments have really made this a major priority. Next slide. But yet when we still look at rural urban differences, we see 
tremendous disparities across the Mountain West, and it can be anywhere from 10 to 20 percent lower vaccination rates in rural districts compared to urban. So the mostly rural is that um, turquoise color, and you look for first dose significantly lower than mostly urban for Utah, the green bar. And you see the same for up to date, the green bar, um, mostly urban for up to date, the turquoise, mostly rural. We're seeing 10 to 20% lower rates in rural settings. Next. So what are some drivers? I'd love for you to put in the chat what, what you think could be affecting the, this. Why do we see these disparities? Feel free to put in the chat or in questions around rural communities and HP vaccine receipt. What are some of these challenges? So when my team and our coalition partners have done a series of in interviews and focus groups and trainings, I definitely agree, provider shortages, lack of primary care providers, transportation, fewer VFC providers in these rural areas, less educated or informed parents. Often in very rural settings, it's hard to find the HPV vaccine. You may need to travel an hour to get to a county health department or further. We have cultural values that aren't as supportive of vaccination recommendations, and these problems have worsened since the pandemic. Lack of messaging around vaccine. We have um, healthcare teams where there's unequal support for the vaccine. So maybe one provider supports HPV and gives that strong recommendation, and others don't. Or maybe the front desk person is a little um, is hesitant about the HPV vaccine and expresses that hesitancy to parents. And furthermore, we have had few evidence based interventions that have really focused on rural communities. Lack of transportation and providers. So getting back for that second and third dose can be a real hassle if you're traveling over an hour. Next slide. In Utah, we have additional challenges because we're the youngest state in the country with the highest per capita birth rate. And so parents with many children, it's hard to balance all of these appointments for follow up. For their kids. So then we looked at vaccine hesitancy among young adults in the Mountain West. So knowing that um, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, Nevada, Montana, that we have low HIV vaccination rates for that NIS teen group, the ages 13 to 17, we hypothesized that by the time these kids are 18, there's still many, many that have not received the HIV vaccine or have not been informed about it. So during the pandemic, we did a survey of about 3,000 young adults in the Western United States, and we did this in partnership with our coalition members. So we distributed the survey to listservs that were affiliated with our coalition. Next slide. And what we found, so we had a very, so we literally surveyed everyone west of the Mississippi, in, including Alaska. We didn't include Hawaii, but we included all the states west um, in the Western US and Alaska. And what we found, we had a large Utah participation because many of our constituents are um, related to Utah activities. But then we had a nice assortment of folks from around the Western US with a variety of urban and rural. So we tried to oversample rural young adults and that's the darker blue. Next, please. So those in the green are those who live in um, zip codes that are classified as rural and urban. So they could be either, so they could be residents of either. But what we found was persistent vaccine hesitancy um, that occurred more frequently among rural young adults than urban, where rural young adults were more likely to think um, vaccines are not a good way to protect yourself from disease. They're more likely to think that vaccines are not safe. They're more likely to think that they are not effective. Next slide. We also saw that they were more likely to um, not think that vaccines are necessary for diseases that aren't common anymore and less likely to feel that vaccines are a good way to protect themselves from diseases. Next slide. Safe and effective, same barriers. And then feeling that HPV vaccine is likely to be pushed by uh, drug companies um, was more likely to occur in rural versus urban. Next slide. 
So we moved some of these challenges and in those data that we saw, we saw, um, so we did that survey of young adults um, at the time that the COVID vaccine was being rolled out. It wasn't rolled out yet. And we found that young adults who had received the HPV vaccine were more likely to say that yes, they would get the COVID vaccine versus young adults who had not received the HPV vaccine were more likely to say that no, they will not get the COVID vaccine. So we moved some of um, like the timely efforts that were needed in the Mountain West to address vaccine hesitancy and improve HIV vaccination in the era of COVID-19 to an online training program, next slide, that we did in partnership with the Area Health Education Centers and American Cancer Society. We had a series of modules that were delivered through a Canvas platform, which is a very academic platform for those of you who are faculty. And each module could be taken at one's own pace. And um, participants in this program could receive CE, which was a huge incentive for providers to participate. We had HPV cancer survivor stories, along with um, looking at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on vaccination. We talked about evidence-based strategies to improve HIV vaccination rates and the importance of getting the HPV vaccine at the youngest ages possible, nine and 10. And we had a couple, we had interactive Q&A sessions and focus groups. Next slide. So we had a phenomenal participation in this online course that was conducted last June. We had 339 participants, large participation in each of the modules. Almost 20% served rural regions, and we had a large percentage serving uh, medically underserved areas. And most of, well, 40% of the participants worked in primary care. Next slide. And we found that, so, Participants want to learn about, especially in the era of COVID-19, how to address vaccine hesitancy. And they wanted up-to-date information about the HPV vaccine guidelines. They wanted to hear the latest and the greatest around evidence-based approaches to improving HPV vaccination. They enjoyed hearing um, about um, recommendations for messages. And they were really um, engaged in how we're able to interact with them and address some of their concerns related to barriers to HPV vaccination. Next slide. And so this is just, we have many, many slides that we could show on how um, the impact of the course, but here's just a few. Participants said that their ability to describe the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on immunization rates improved from prior to the training to after. Their ability to provide useful and compelling information about the HIV vaccine to parents to aid in dis making decisions to vaccinate improved from prior to the training to after, and their knowledge of strategies to increase vaccination rates improved from prior to the training to afterwards. So that all st statistically significant improvements. Next slide. And one other um, effort that we've been making is in, we have partnered with a gigantic healthcare system in the West, Intermountain Healthcare, to do tailored trainings for clinics who are in regions of Utah, and we will expand to other states as more funding becomes available to um, tailor the specific barriers that these clinics are, are experiencing in these rural counties in Utah, which are have very low HP vaccination rates are the ones that we're targeting. We have an intensive mentorship program, but which includes in incentives for um, providers, healthcare team members, parents and kids to participate in either the training activities or receiving HP vaccination. We've been giving out University of Utah swag to kids going into rural counties getting the HPV vaccine and it's working. It's really exciting. Next slide. So some action steps that I am suggesting for you are to get to know the demographic characteristics of the communities in your region. Understand the levels of vaccine hesitancy in your region by demographic characteristics and understand how co the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced um, changes in these levels of vaccine hesitancy. And my last recommendation is start with a meeting with key partners in vaccination, public health, primary care, and cancer prevention in your region to discuss ways to work together to improve HIV vaccination. Start with listening and then go from there. It's been an honor to present today, and thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I'm always available to meet via Zoom or phone to discuss um, ways to partner, and anyone is welcome to join our coalition listserv. We have monthly newsletters so, and monthly meetings on Zoom. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dr. Kappa. Such a informative presentation. We just want to thank you for the information you provide. Again, if you have any questions for Dr. Kepta and all of our panelists, we encourage you please drop those questions in our Q&A. We have segmented some time later during our presentation to answer any questions that you may have. So we're going to go ahead and move forward with our second panelist for today, Shanta Chambers. Uh, Shanta is a nonprofit executive who career spans more than 25 years of experience in chronic disease prevention and community engagement. As EFP of Health Equity Initiatives and Community Engagement, she's responsible for the development and execution of the Foundation's national strategy to address health equity with a specific focus on persons with chronic health conditions residing in low-income communities. Shanta serves as the principal investigator for the Self-Made Health Network, one of eight national networks that comprise CDC's national network approach to preventing and controlling tobacco-related cancers in special populations. She oversees the implementation of evidence-based strategies to advance the prevention of commercial tobacco use and early detection of cancer among populations with low socioeconomic characteristics. It's our pleasure to welcome Shanta, and we look forward to your presentation. So good morning and good afternoon. We can go ahead and advance to the first slide. Uh, we're actually going to start with a Mentimeter question. And so go ahead and scan. I have the pleasure of working very closely with some state comprehensive cancer control programs in their coalition, and I just want to know how many of you actually have worked with your state comprehensive cancer coalition. I see some yeses and some no's kind of popping up in the chat. So I am hopeful that at the conclusion, for those of you who are working, that you're continuing to work with them. And for those of you who have not had an opportunity, that this may be kind of a stimulus for you to reach out to either your state comprehensive cancer coalition or your state comp cancer program. Next slide, please. So needless to say, I'm so excited to be with you today. And I think the comments that I'm going to share with you are strategically situated between my fellow presenters. Um, additionally, I intend to highlight some lessons that we as a national network have learned after the launch of our first community of practice, which was really designed to address HPV vaccination, um, working very closely with National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Next slide. So in 2020, um, Tribe Networks, and as, as Gabby mentioned in the introduction, Self-Made Health is one of eight national networks jointly supported by the CDC Division of Cancer Prevention and Control and the Office of Smoking and Health to address cancer and tobacco-related um, disparities among specific special populations. And of course, our focus is those with low SES. Um, in, in 2020, we had an opportunity to partner with two of our fellow national networks, um, Notre's Voces, which focuses on Hispanic individuals and the Geographic Health Equity Alliance, which focuses on populations experiencing geographic disparities. And so together we launched um, the, the tribe network, HPV Learning Collaborative, which was really designed to help build capacity of state comprehensive cancer control programs to improve HPV vaccination rates among special populations. And for us, our focus was, of course, low SES, Hispanic, and those living in geographic disparate community. Um, the, the Learning Collaborative was really designed to highlight some best and promising practices from the field for improving HPV vaccination rates in three areas. We wanted to look at programs, we wanted to look at policies, and also strategic communication. And as we begin to, um, in, in our first cohort, we really wanted to help states do a couple of things, identify and implement best practice activities and promising practices um, to conduct strategic communication campaigns to improve awareness and adoption of evidence-based strategies to increase HPV vaccination, adopt and implement policies, both legislatively and or institutional um, strategies, and basically also improve knowledge on HPV vaccination cancer control, cancer prevention. So needless to say, um, we quickly learned that our, our state comp cancer programs, they have some limited capacity. So we quickly learned where is the opportunity? So if you really had to help programs really streamline and focus where was the greatest opportunity um, to really bring about that change. And so we quickly learned that 
states teams could really benefit from more guidance on implementing policy systems and environmental change strategies. This helped us by realizing that limited staffing infrastructures really did exist within state health departments. So a shift to focus on more upstream types of policy approaches was really warranted. This also allowed the state teams, as I mentioned, to really be able to narrow their focus and go really deep. And so as we thought about that, we really used that feedback from cohort one to really inform how we approach cohort two. Next slide. And so we realized that, okay, we had to change our process. So instead of really help trying to help state cancer Comp cancer programs in their coalition focus on a lot of things. We really figured that really helping them focus on this whole approach around policy systems and environmental change was really the best way to go. And so what that allowed us to do was this opportunity to really help them think a little bit differently around the narrative. And so what that availed to us was an opportunity to really apply this, this philosophy around equity as they began to really think about how they could address HPV vaccinations moving forward. Next slide. So when we look through this an equity informed lens, what it forces us to look at are the factors that may be unique to our population of focus. When we really think about equity as both a process by looking at multicultural, multi-ethnic, ethnic and multi-sectorial coalitions, and also thinking about health equity as an outcome. That is really the opportunity for us to really think upstream. And I have to give credit to my colleague, Andrew Romero at the Geographic Health Equity Alliance for really helping us to think about this, this lens of equity as both a process as well as an outcome. What this allows us to do, it really, it, it allows us and it also requires us to survey who is missing from the table. And this discussion requires engagement of our population of focus throughout the entire process from, from intervention design to even implementation to evaluation to even dissemination of our learnings. What it also does, it, it allows us, it allows for the elevation of the voices of the population at risk for the most harm resulting from our current systems and structural barriers. So an equity informed approach requires us to ask, as Dr. Kepta um, closed out her presentation, it requires us to ask, it requires us to listen, and then in collaboration with key stakeholders, create an opportunity for sustainable change, which is much different than how we tend to approach um, our engagement with communities in the past. Sometimes we come in, already with our fully baked strategy, but really not giving space for our population of focus to really help to inform the strategies that we want to adopt. Next slide, please. So, so there's been a lot of talk over the last two years about health equity and social determinants of health and things of that nature, but we oftentimes throw things out, but don't always bring the resources to help people really Think about what that means and what that looks like. So one resource I want to make sure that I share with all of you is actually this racial equity toolkit from GARE. It is a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal tool to really help you think about centering your activities around this lens called equity. What it does, it, it prompts you to ask some very practical questions around both your practice, your strategy, um, as well as your budget. It forces you to really think about as you think about the strategy that you're going to employ, who will be harmed by it, right? So we would naturally think, oh, we're talking about HPV vaccination. It is no way that anyone can be harmed by it. But in some of our approaches and some of our strategies, although not intended, there can be some harm to our focus population that we did not even intend to cause. So being able to use this type of toolkit allows you and your coalition partners to really think about your strategy through this lens of addressing equity. Next slide. So as I mentioned, when we first started with cohort one, we were really working with states, again, around program strategies, around strategic communication, and then around policy. And then we quickly learned with some of the, the learning sessions that were focused on policy that that was really our North Star. This also happened around the same time when CDC was releasing um, DP20, 2-2202, which was the new funding opportunity for cup cancer programs. And in that funding opportunity, there was this new significant focus on policy, including a requirement for all state 
national comprehensive cancer programs to actually have some a policy director is actually how they called it out. So we realized that if there was ever a time to really work with state comp cancer programs in their coalition to really think more upstream around policy strategies, that now is this actual time. And so again, this just really provided a great opportunity for us to really support um, comp cancer programs and their partners around policy strategies specifically are related to HPV. Next slide. So this is a little bit small to see, but I think they're going to share it all. Um, this is really just us cataloging. We, when we begin to think about this work, the first thing that we wanted to do was to really catalog all of the potential policy opportunities to increase HPV vaccination in rural communities. As you see here, this is some research done by um, Dr. Vanderpool, Dr. Stratman, and of course, Dr. Brandt that really talks about this concept of big P and little p policy. For those of you who may be representing state health department, uh, I, I spent 15 years at a health department and the P word policy was the word that we never ever said because there was always this apprehension around the true role that state employees could actually play in the investment of policies. However, what this does is create this unique opportunity to engage your cancer coalitions in more of these upstream strategies that public health can help support by providing the necessary background and data to really make the case for why such policy interventions are necessary. Next slide. So what we began to do for cohort two is we began to kind of catalog potential policies that could be undertaken by state comprehensive cancer programs in collaboration with their cancer coalitions to really advance policies. And we really thought about those in terms of big P policy, which may be more legislative types of policies, as well as little P policies, which could be some of the institutional policies. I'm so excited to hear from Indiana because what they're also going to demonstrate is how they've actually leveraged policy specific to their vaccine for children program to really be able to advance HPV vaccination. And as you see here, some of these policy opportunities include school entry requirements, increasing reimbursement rates for vaccine, expansion of the vaccine for children um, program, client reminders, et cetera. Next slide. And before I actually go there, one of the things that we also did um, when we began to make this shift in our process to focus on policy, we realized that we had to do some level setting. So we actually hosted a series of three webinars that will focus on policy. One was focused on the importance of pursuing policy, big P policy, the opportunities for big P policies for increasing um, HPV vaccine uptake and opportunities for little P policy. So all three of these policy focused webinars are available on demand and I'll have my contact information at the end in the event you would like to learn more about them. So one of the things I saw also come up in the word cloud was around data. Well, there's a, there are three levels of data that I think are critically important as you begin to think about your policy strategy, right? So you have data at this 5,000 fit level. So that's when we're really looking at our surveillance system and asking ourselves, what is the problem? So we're looking at our surveillance systems. We're looking at our vaccines registries. Those are more of those kind of 5,000 foot data. Um, data platforms. And then there's this 1,000 foot data. So who and where, where is the problem? And this is an opportunity for us to really be looking at subpopulation data because we, when we begin to look at subpopulation data, again, in an environment where you may have both limited financial and human resources, what it does afford you is an opportunity to really say which population is most significantly impacted, or in this case, which population tends to have the lowest vaccination rate. And if you can't address everyone, it allows you to be very strategic and looking at who is most impacted. And then you're on the ground. Um, as, as Dr. Kepta pointed out, you know, she's done some of this with some key informant interviews. This and focus groups, this is what I like to call um, where you apply your 100 cup of coffee philosophy. If you've heard 100 cup of coffee is really a process around community engagement and it allows you to create space to have these 100 cups of coffee with community level stakeholders and individuals to really understand what may be the contributing factors prohibiting them from being able to participate in this case in HPV vaccination. Next slide. 
So, so very quickly, you know, a couple of things and, and part of my call to action. Um, as you think about, or if you're beginning to think about more upstream approaches, looking at policy, assess the current capacity of your coalition, assess the current composition of your coalition. So if you were doing an actual um, communication campaign, or maybe some education and outreach, maybe you're coalition was com composed of individuals and organizations to really help you do that. However, now if you want to make that shift towards policy, you may need some additional stakeholders at the table that you may not have had before, meaning you might need to have the representative from your from your local PTA, or you may need to have some additional school board members on your comp on your pol on your actual coalition, or you may have to bring in some other policy experts to really help to inform and shape what your policy strategy needs to look like. And also assessing your coalition's readiness to really look at these upstream upstream policy approaches. If you don't feel like you're ready now, that doesn't mean that you won't get ready. Really ask yourself, okay, if we really want to apply these upstream policy strategies, what are those things that we need to do as a, as a coalition to actually prepare ourselves for that? And the Tribe Network is actually building an, a, set, a, a tool to really help coalitions assess their policy readiness. And then lastly, I would say conduct inventory of your data availability. And when I say data availability, I mean data availability specific to your focus population. Do you really have the data in your toolbox or access to the data that you need to really help to inform the, um, the needs of your focus population? If it doesn't exist, that doesn't mean that you have to go out and curate a new survey. Maybe this is an opportunity to engage with a new partner, a new stakeholder who may have access to the data that you need to really help you make that compelling case to advance your policy agenda. Next slide. As I mentioned, um, I have the pleasure of working with four other phenomenal networks and Appeal is the latest one that's joined our collaborative team and they work with Asian and Pacific Islanders specifically. And I just want to represent here the strength of collaboration. So as you think about your path forward, we're working either very closely with your comp cancer program, or for those of you who may not be working with your comp cancer program, it's an opportunity because right now they have this requirement to really look at policy and maybe HPV related policy may be the opportunity for you to engage in a way that you haven't before. Thank you. Next slide. That concludes my presentation. Here's my contact information. Again, as I mentioned, we have available those webinars that are kind of an intro introduction to HPV related policy, as well as some additional tools around data that you can really use to help make the case. Thank you so much again for your time. And I look forward to the question and answer. Thank you, Shanta. Such a great conversation and presentation. As someone who participated in cohort one of the Tri Network Collaborative, the Learning Collaborative, I uh, really appreciated the way in which they thought or made our coalition stretch and think about big P, little P. So I'm glad that you're able to cover the content today as part of the presentation. Uh, and I think she actually did a good connection with two of our other presenters. So I'm excited also to keep the program moving and present two of our final presenters for today. Uh, I got the pleasure of meeting them this past month on the on the first of this month in Indiana. Uh, they're doing really great things in Indiana, and so we're excited to see what they'll present today. So our first of the uh, dual presenters um, are, is Lisa Robertson. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree from Hanover College in 1996 and her master's in public health from Indiana University in 2002. She currently serves as the executive director for Indiana's Immunization Coalition. She spent 11 years as the executive director of Reach Out and Read Indiana, uh, which was a pediatric literacy program using books to help assess development and sending books into the homes of young children. She accepted her role as the executive director for the Indiana Immunization Coalition in 2013. The coalition's mission is to reduce the spread of vaccine preventable diseases, uh, which is done through education, advocacy, and direct service. To join her is Dave McCormick, who serves as the director of Indiana's Department of Health Immunization Division. Um, in that role, Dave leads a team of public health professionals committed to limiting vaccination or vaccine preventable diseases 
by working with approximately 750 healthcare providers to deliver over 80 million of publicly funded vaccines. In 2015, July, Dave was elected to the executive board of the Association of Immunization Managers, serving as chair in 2019. In 2016, Dave was elected to the executive board of the American Immunization Registry Association, having served as president and currently serves as the chair of the governance committee. So let's go ahead and welcome both Lisa and Dave as our last presenters for today's event. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Lisa and I are going to do a little tag team here. Um, but first, we have a poll here. So we want to hear from you on what does your state regularly review VFC providers HPV initiation and completion rate? So does your state regularly review HPV providers or VFC providers HPV initiation and completion rates? Okay, well, after today's presentation, we're going to move those two no votes to a yes for sure. All right, so this afternoon, we're going to talk about a project that we did here in Indiana, um, taking some of the data, looking at some of the requirements of the VFC program, and then applying a public health strategy to, the, to that. Um, the Strategy that we used was a maintenance of certification. And uh, Lisa's gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna kind of set it up, uh, talk about the data that we collected on our HPV rates, talk about the VFC program and the authority we had under that. And then uh, Lisa will talk about how we actually did our maintenance of certification. So if I could have the next slide, please. So as with all programs, we're data driven. So we were looking at all of our adolescent vaccines and we noticed that there are quite a few things that are happening in the state of Indiana. One, we have very um, active and aggressive school requirements. So we require pretty much um, all vaccines for school with the exception of seasonal influenza, meningococcal B and HPV. And of course, COVID, we, we do not require COVID. So, uh, you know, th with that mandate, we've created a lot of touch points for other vaccines that are not mandated, specifically HPV. So when we started looking at our adolescent rates, we were really discouraged that we were second in the nation in 2017 for uh, Tdap, but we were at one point, I believe in 2014, last in the nation for HPV initiation in, in males. So what that told us is we definitely were having these touch points with providers. We just weren't getting strong recommendations for HPV vaccines. Now, Indiana is a conservative state and um, we believe that our adolescents never have sex until they get married. And so we don't need to talk about that. Um, I'm saying that kind of tongue in cheek, um, but that was kind of the, the mantra that we were having to work through is that nobody wanted to talk about HPV because it was related to an STI. And so we really had to do a lot of groundwork around that. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So we started looking at mandates. And of course we knew that with the conservative state that we lived in, there would be no way that we could recommend HPV as a school requirement. So we started looking at what do we mandate and what could we tack on and complement um, to an immunization um, initiative. And so what we started looking at was our VFC program. So we have about 750 providers, provider offices, if you will, that participate in our VFC program. And one of the requirements for the VFC program is that you have to do annual education. Now we, we kind of looked into this and, you know, our thought always was that the education had to be on storage and handling or the requirements of the BFC program, such as eligibility or a disease state, but that really wasn't the case. There was a really um, broad path there that you could follow with education. So we started looking at what could we, what could we require as an educational component through the BFC program that would increase HPV immunization rates. 
we have a state health commissioner that is an OBGYN. She spent 30 years um, as an OBGYN in practice. And she will tell you, if you get a chance to speak with her, that she could spend her whole career only dealing with HPV related illnesses and cancers. And so she's very passionate about this. And in fact, um, prior to COVID, we probably would have been looking at some kind of mandate on HPV. Uh, but COVID has really changed the landscape of what we look like in Indiana as far as immunizations. Everybody's a little standoffish about immunizations at this point. So again, that just refocused what we need to do is, is complement something that's already existing that's not controversial and try to work through that. So what we decided was to look at our providers and see how their immunization rates were for HPV. We found that there was a very strong breakpoint at 25% completion rate for HPV up to date. So in looking at our providers, our providers either did a really good job or they did a really bad job. There wasn't a whole lot of it in between there. So what we decided to do was look at those providers that were below 25% for HPV um, completion and require them as part of their education for the annual uh, VFC re-enrollment to do a maintenance of certification on HPV vaccination. Now, when we looked at this, uh, this included almost 300 clinic sites, but really over 500 individual providers. Next slide, please. So what we did is we did a letter to all of our providers stating that as part of their educational requirement for the, the upcoming year for the VFC, program, they had to complete this maintenance of certification. They had to participate in a multi-week course. They had to watch a video. They had to do some record keeping, and they had to enroll with this. If they could not meet these requirements, they needed to notify us and have some justification of why they could not do this. Um, we had very few people notify us and say that they could not participate in this. Many of them did not want to participate, but um, it wasn't that they couldn't participate. So we had a lot of barriers that people talked about, like, well, how do I get everybody in my office to, to enroll in this? Or, um, you know, we had some providers that peer pressure of the other providers in the office that were doing a great job, um, you know, in kind of uh, motivated them to make some change. Because they're saying, you know, the other docs in my practice are on me or upset with me because they all now have to take this training because I'm not offering it. So, you know, some peer pressure was a was a great thing as well. So one of the things we put in this letter um, was that failure to participate in this educational effort may put their participation in the VFC program in jeopardy. And I want to highlight this because our intent was never to create a barrier for uh, VFC eligible children to receive vaccines. We just wanted to make sure that they were making a strong recommendation for all ACIP recommended vaccines and specifically HPV. We did not um, have any intentions of excluding someone from a VFC program, but we did um, want to make this very strongly worded so that individuals knew that we were serious. I had a lot of providers call and say, I don't understand why your data is wrong because we vaccinate every single person that comes through our office. And I love to tell the story about the, the provider that told us that. And you know, we went back to him and said, well, the reason that you're on this is because you haven't ordered HPV vaccine in a period of time. And what was happening is this provider was making a very strong recommendation, but he had an office member office staff member that was coming in behind him saying, oh, you don't want the HPV vaccine. It's not safe. It's not a good vaccine. And so there was a huge disconnect in their office. So one of the things talking about this maintenance of certification was that everybody in the office had to be on board and had to be making that strong recommendation. So the letter uh, went out again to almost 300 provider offices and in, in cap, encapsulated about 500 providers in total. Um, we did work with uh, the coalition, coalition to make sure that they had, and you'll see in the letter, um, they actually went to the coalition's website to enroll in this maintenance of certification program. 
Um, we did talk with CDC about this idea as well. Um, we wanted to make sure that, you know, there wouldn't be any pitfalls of we require this and they came back and said, no, this wouldn't be an allowable thing. And CDC was very supportive of doing this educational event. So I will turn it now over to Lisa to follow through with the maintenance of certification. Thanks, Dave. You can go to the next slide, please. So just a quick overview of what a maintenance of certification project is. Um, physicians are required to take an approved maintenance of certification project for their continued licensure through their boards. So this maintenance of certification was created and approved through the American Board of Pediatrics and the American Board of Family Medicine in 2014. Um, since then, and when Dave asked us about requiring this for his VFC providers, um, at that point, we were all paper and pencil. We were faxing information back and forth to the providers. And we realized, because I have only one staff member who was running this program, um, that we had to streamline it. So when Dave asked us to do this project, we decided to take the MOC online so that we could effectively serve all of these providers in the state and throughout the country because it's um, not just in Indiana. So in 2018, our maintenance of certification project became completely online, which has helped us then collect the data and serve providers across the country. Next slide, please. So the components of an MOC is that there's a pre-test and a post-test. We have a toolkit on the website that has um, tips and talking points, there's flyers, there's posters, there's um, education. So a lot of different resources for providers in the HPV toolkit. And then each month, the provider logs the number of patients eligible for their first dose of HPV vaccine, the number of patients who actually received the HPV vaccine, and then the number of patients who received an appointment for their second dose, because we know that um, best practice is that to schedule that appointment before they leave your office. And so we wanted to know who was who was there and could have gotten the vaccine, who actually got it, and who was using the best practice of scheduling their next appointment. And then in order to meet the board licensure component of this MOC, you have to read a quality improvement module and complete a test around that. This project lasts for six months um, and providers all have, again, the online portal where they can regis register and then they can go and enter data um, as they have it. So they don't have to do it every day, even every week. Um, they have the option to enter the data um, whenever it's convenient for them throughout the month. Next slide, please. So some results, and I'll go through these kind of quickly, but go ahead to the next slide. So this is the change in vaccination rate over the six months project. And this, we were just looking at those providers that had enrolled because of the BFC requirement. So over the course of the program, 102 providers increased their vaccination rates, while about 101 doctors reported um, decreases or no changes. And what was um, interesting, I guess, to note about this is there were several providers who registered for the program and then entered zeros for all of their data. So they technically met the requirements of the program, um, but they didn't actually do it. Um, but even when you're looking at if we could change over 100 providers' attitudes around HPV vaccination, we can start to move the needle up in the state. Next slide, please. This just looks at the attitude of the providers over the six months project. So um, in general, most doctors reported a positive attitude both before and after the program. Some attitudes changed positively and some of them changed negatively. And then there were those that were negative both before and after. So a little bit of everything, but most people, most providers were positive, had positive attitudes both before and after the project. Next slide, please. And this looks at the, um, the vaccination rate increase based on um, the provider's attitudes prior to starting the program. So doctors who reported being less likely to recommend the vaccine before the program reported a larger increase in vaccination rates. So if they had, you know, they were less likely to vaccinate before they started our MOC, by the end of the project, they were, they were had the biggest changes in vaccination rates. So overall, we saw 
over those um, 203 doctors who actually completed the program, we saw an 8% increase in vaccination rates. So um, we were thrilled with that data just because, you know, every, if we could move it up every, you know, six months and do a 10% increase across our lowest providers, we're gonna, we're going to vaccinate more kids. So next slide, please. So in January in 2022, we looked um, at this data again, and we looked at the list of VFC providers that had an up-to-date rate of less than 25%. So that's what we had looked at in 2018, 2019. So in um, 2018, 2019, we had 288 clinics that had a 20, um, 25% or less up-to-date rate for HPV. And then in 2022, we only had 143 offices on that list. So there was a big decrease in the number of, of providers who were under that threshold. So that was exciting news. Unfortunately, 61 of the clinics who were on the list the first time around were still on the list the second time around. Um, and we only had 82 new providers that were added to our to our non-performing HPV provider list. So we did see some really good movement in HPV education and vaccination rates. Um, we have seen that our VFC providers are doing better and we still have a long way to go. And I think Dave's gonna talk about some other projects that we've been working on to um, continue to improve our vaccination rates for HPV. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, <laughs> thanks, Lisa. So, you know, this was our first try at this. And so what we decided is this, as Lisa mentioned, you know, any any providers that you can get to move the needle on their perception of HPV, it's worth trying to do this again. And so we're committed to doing this again and again until we, we change the culture here in Indiana. So um, providers around, or providers with low HPV rates are, are going to be bombarded with this uh, requirement again. We're going to look every two years and make sure that uh, you know we're monitoring the data that we collect and having these providers with low HPV rates into an MOC to try to change their perception. Now we know that some of those, as Lisa mentioned, there were 61 that had no change at all, and many of them just entered zero. But that's okay. We're going to keep working with them until you know we get that done. We also have found some other low hanging fruit. So one of the things you know that CDC measures is first rate or first dose rate, and then also completion rate. And so we are going to be doing a reminder recall out of our um, immunization information system every quarter to those individuals that have started the series but haven't completed it. And I know COVID has been, um, you know, one of the big barriers here. We've had providers that have delayed appointments or, you know, many pro providers uh, totally closed their office for a period of time. So we're going to work with, um, with our providers, with our vaccination community, and try to get those kids caught up again. We're also going to be looking at forecasting in our registry. Um, right now, we forecast our first dose of HPV at 11 and 12. And we're working on moving, I believe there are seven other states that are now forecasting HPV at nine. And so we will probably be making that change uh, sometime early in December. So that we'll be promoting nine, um, nine years of age as the starting point for HPV vaccination. And hopefully when they come in to get their adolescent vaccines, that'll be the time that we can catch them up and complete them. Um, and then, we're also working on a letter that will go out to all of our providers, just reinforcing our commitment to HPV, making sure that they recognize that this is the new norm. We start kids early, we get them fully vaccinated, and we protect them from HPV-related illnesses and cancers. We're not going to be talking about STIs. We're talking about cancer prevention here. Next slide. So some of our action steps are, you know, to regularly review with your VFC providers, what their HPV rates are. We've done a lot of our um, IQIP visits uh, focusing around HPV and making sure that they know 
that, you know, here are the rates, here's where you should be, here are your missed opportunities. Um, you know, do regular checks with your, your HPV providers on HPV ordering practices. Look to see if they're ordering, you know, theoretically, they should be ordering the same amount of MCV4 vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, as they are HPV vaccine, making sure that there's a one-to-one -one ratio there. Um, you know, schedule meetings with stakeholders. Talk about the barriers that are out there. You know, we've had regular meetings for a period of time. A lot of people don't want to come together and talk right now about, you know, routine vaccinations. We're still focused on COVID or we went from COVID to monkeypox or, you know, now we're in seasonal influenza. It's time to get back to just our normal routine vaccinations. Bring everybody together. Let's talk about what the barriers are and figure out a way to move past those. Um, you know, again, implement educational opportunities for all VFC providers. Encourage them about that nine years of age recommendation. Get that in there. Um, use report cards. We do a lot of report cards. And we do that just to show this is where you are. This is where you are compared to other providers in your county and other providers in the state. Um, we may also start looking at this is where you are in, comparative, in comparison to other providers in the state, but also in Region 5. So let's make sure we're looking at what's going on around us. And then think of encouraging or mandating quality improvement opportunities like the maintenance of certification with those lowest vaccinators. Uh, I know the Indiana Immunization Coalition, although they're housed in Indiana, doesn't mean that they can only be um, utilized in, this, in the state of Indiana. Um, I believe at one time, Lisa told me that we had more providers in states outside of Indiana that were actually using the maintenance of certification program than we did inside the state of Indiana. So next slide, please. I wanted to give you a little idea of who some of our active partners are. Of course, we work very closely with our, Medi our state Medicaid office, but also our Medicaid managed care entities. Um, you know, we've worked with the American Cancer Society. They've been a great supporter, um, but also AAP. And what I know from working with AAP is that a lot of people are, are very uh, worried that if you do public health activities, you may be taking someone out of their medical home. Right now, everyone recognizes that because of COVID, there's a lot of work to do to catch up kids just with normal routine activities. And so make the best use of public health. Work with your AAP to, to promote other uh, non-traditional vaccine touch points, whether it be school-related uh, or school-located vaccination clinics, whether it be mass clinics, whether it even be pharmacy for some kids. We know there's there's plenty of room for everyone to be vaccinating, especially against HPV with our low rates. Also, uh, working with our pharmacists association, you know, I, one of my big goals is to try to get our VFC program into many pharmacies in the state of Indiana. Right now, we have a disparity of care, so if you have plenty, or I'm sorry, if you have um, private insurance. You have plenty of touch points that you can go to across the state, but if you are a Medicaid eligible child that is on our VFC program, I believe there are only seven pharmacies in the state of Indiana where you could go on an, on an evening or a weekend to be vaccinated. And that's creating a huge barrier that we need to try to address. Uh, next slide, please. And then you just have our contact information. Both Lisa and I, I'm speaking for Lisa here, uh, would be more than than happy to talk with any of you if you would like to replicate the program that we have going on. If you'd like to see some of the data that we've had, some of our letters that we've sent out, um, or even some of the report card templates that we have, please do not hesitate to let us out. Or I'm sorry, let us know. Lisa, anything you would like to add to close out? No, I think you said it all. But again, we um, work nationally. A lot of our programs are online and they're um, available to anyone across the nation. So please reach out or check out our um, website at vaccinateindiana.org and um, we'll, we'll help you guys get started. Thank you, Lisa and Dave. We appreciate your conversation and your presentation. Uh, we appreciate all the level of insight you can provide. Um, we had a few questions that seemed that some of the questions were answered during your presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we are a little bit out of time for the, the Q&A and discussion. 
So what I would encourage is that if you have a, a burning question that you would like to share or um, just get insight from our presenters on, please feel free to email them. Uh, yes, we will be sharing our slide deck and all of our presenters have agreed to respond to your inquiries and your questions. We want the information to be super valuable to you. And so we will be sharing that as well as our contact information at the end of this webinar series today. So before you guys leave, please take a moment to complete the evaluation of our seminar. The link will be provided in the chat. We value your feedback and especially your recommendations for the type of content that is most valuable to you. I would like to say thank you to the planning committee, presenters, facilitators, and partners at the American Cancer Society, National HPV Vaccination Roundtable, Indiana Immunization Coalition, St. Jude Research Hospital, and our meeting proctor. And thank you all for joining with us. As a reminder, this seminar is recorded. The link will be provided to you guys along with a PDF as well as handouts, which will also include our presenters' contact information. Please, 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 evaluation is valuable. Please go ahead and complete it on our behalf. We wanna hear about things that went well and things that did not go well, um, as well as information that you found most interesting and would like to learn more about in future efforts. So again, thank you guys for taking the time and have a great and wonderful day.